we can hear from a Swansea company, we predict to enlighten you on this very subject. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome James Davis. Um, Jamie, don't go away. Um, how's your maths? Um, terrible. Terrible. My, uh, it's why I went into journalism. I'm completely enumerous. <laughs> Would you, would you say, statistically speaking, you're an average man? No, I'm well below average. Um, and I'm not the first person to say that. Well, should, should we find out how average you I are? I don't like perhaps? being uh, put on the spot like this. <laughs> I'm beginning to feel sorry for our audience now. I, I just want to make sure that you're not like a covert statistics professor and that some of my questions are going to come out with the right answers. Do you know, I'm very confident that won't be the case. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'd like to speak to you about, uh, about data, and um, data big and small. I'm uh, uh, pretty sure that the, the terminology used in this space um, is pretty uh, uh, prevalent now. We've all heard big data probably 20 times a day, 30 times a day, 100 times yesterday. Um, what I'd like to ask really is whether or not the size of the data sets that we have in our businesses um, is correlated to their value. You know, do you have to have a terabyte worth of uh, Twitter uh, feedback information before you can start finding out new things about your, about your business. So um, I'm going to run through a, a, couple of, uh, a couple of examples where small data is useful um, and then move on to big data. So um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is something called the, uh, the birthday paradox. Um, so this is where you come in, uh, Jamie. So, um, uh, Imagine you had a, a room and you wanted to find out whether or not you had a greater than 50% chance that two people in that room um, shared a birthday. Okay, so not a birth date, you know, weren't bo born on the same day, but were both born on, say, the uh, 18th of February. So how many people do you think you might need to have um, to, to have a greater than 50% chance that two people would share a birthday? Is there like a... 100,000 people. A hundred... Yeah, I've, I've, I've never met anybody with the same birthday okay. as me. Okay, so you've... Never. You've, so you've just in my short life. Unfortunately, you displayed yourself as, as, as below average. Uh, I was afraid the, this might be the case. Okay, so, so I was going to talk you through this so that you feel, feel a bit better. So um, if you've got 366 potential birthdays um, during the year, you might logically think that if you had 188 people, um, that you had a greater than 50% chance. Um, uh, the fact is that it's a much smaller number than that. And um, uh, here's, the, uh, here's the math. <laughs> um, I'm not going to go through the math. And in fact, I've put this up to make a point, really. Um, this, this doesn't make any sense to anyone at the moment. You know, there's no description of the notation. Um, I think quite a lot of the time, uh, mathematicians and, and statisticians like to give the impression that if you stick up this, uh, this formula that everyone knows what we're doing, and for all the arts and Englishy and, you know, non-technical people here, this doesn't mean anything to anyone. No, it right does. Now. I feel an overwhelming sense of nausea. <laughs> so, it's uh, my maths lessons coming back. So, uh, so I'm going to explain this in a, in a, in a slightly easier to understand way. So, um, Let's imagine that we've got 22 people hanging out uh, at a party, um, and, then, and then Jack Black turns up, okay? So uh, Jack Black's turned up. How many new combinations does Jack Black create when he arrives at this party? So 22 people there, and then a 23rd person arrives, okay? So he has now made 22 new combinations. So if you count backwards from the 22 all the way back down to the beginning, we find out that for 23 people that there are 253 potential combinations of birthdays. And so the, the correct answer to your question, which I believe you answered 100,000. Well, I thought you meant the year, the month, and the day. I only wish that I'd explicitly said that at the beginning of the question. He says backtracking desperately. <laughs> um, the actual answer is 23. So uh, in, in this example, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's probably slightly uh, counterintuitive, and, and probability is counterintuitive. You only need 23 um, data points here to, to find out something quite interesting. Now, if we look back to our, our lives, you know, where do we commonly hang out with 23 people? Um, the chances are that you know, someone in your class shared a birthday with someone else in your class at school. So what's that, 25, maybe, maybe 30 people. So you do see it around, but 
perhaps you're not necessarily aware that that, that probability exists. Um, Jamie, thank you very much for... It's a huge relief to be going. For, for being there for me. <clears throat> okay, so I, I, I'm, I like listening to people talk about big data. Um, it's been fascin you know, fascinating for us to see how the companies that we work with have all of a sudden uh, wake, woken up to how valuable this information is that they have on their customers, on their products. Um, I think pretty much everyone has now gone through the epiphany that maybe, you know, Mike, who's good on Excel, probably shouldn't be a data, uh, a data source for important decisions that we're making, and there should be a bit more of a, uh, a focus on the information that we have on our, on our products and our customers. Um, however, I think it can sometimes be a little bit, uh, you know, uh, unclear as to, as, as to why the information is valuable and how big your data set needs to be um, to be interesting. Um, so what I'm going to do right here, right now, um, is a bit of a probability stunt. Um, we've, uh, uh, we've done some modeling, and we think that there is a very decent chance, um, greater than 75% chance, that on one of these tables, completely randomly, are two people sat next to each other who share the same birthday. Okay? So um, again, we'll just not make Jamie's mistake. We're not all looking for the 18th of February, 1975, my birthday. Um, we're looking for the actual birthday, which is the 18th of February. Um, so as I say, we did some modeling. We've got a greater than 75% chance to find that out. Um, there's a 20 odd percent chance that this won't work, and uh, uh, our, our CTO, who's, got, who's a professor in statistics, was seriously unhappy that there was a 20 percent chance of failure. Um, but uh, the way I look at it is that there's a uh, almost 80 percent chance of success. Um, so what I'd like you to do is, if we can just uh, raise the lights a little bit, um, so that everyone can uh, look at each other, um, can you just quickly talk on the tables that you're at? share each other's birthday, um, and then let me know whether or not I was right and Tim was wrong about doing this particular test. Um, just, to, uh, just, to add some, uh, just to add some spice to this investigation, um, I'm now going to offer a prize a prize to the people who find out first that they were in fact birthday buddies on table whatever the table is. Uh, no reconfiguring of tables, there are cheaters here, cheaters. <laughs> And no one from my team is going to pretend? Ah, oh, OK. So the interesting thing here was that once I introduced the prize, um, I was going to suggest that perhaps we might need to see some paperwork, because now I'm skewing my data set, right? You know, you guys have got a, an incentive um, to answer positively. Have I really not done it? I can't believe it. OK. So, um, Failure is not so bad. I get to keep the champagne. I'm not going to drink it with any of you guys. Um, but one of the interesting things here is that you know, once you start collecting this sort of information, and once the people who are having that information collected from them, um, it kind of skews the data that you get back. So you know, maybe next time I give this presentation, um, we have more sets of twins um, coming to uh, Digital 2015. Um, really understanding why the information is collected is almost as important as the data itself. And I think you know, that a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the interest in big data is tailing off at the moment. There have been some, um, uh, been some unsuccessful, uh, uh, unsuccessful use cases. And really, it's because there's not enough um, applied statisticians and mathematicians involved in these processes to make sure that actually the information is being transferred into the solutions that we're looking for uh, effectively. So the McKinsey um, Global Institute produced what was called the Big Data Report. I highly recommend that you um, read it. It's a couple of years old now, um, but the information is, is massively relevant. It looks at uh, how um, data analytics is going to affect um, practices in the public sector, the private sector. Um, uh, the government uh, representatives here might be interested to see how that might be used to close the tax gap um, and some, some other use cases as well. 
But what we took from this, um, what we took from this report was that uh, McKinsey felt there was going to be a shortfall of 140,000 people in North America alone with the skills to actually take these um, data sets and turn them into the actionable information that we need. So um, that's quite a lot of people. Um, by 2018, we're unlikely to, uh, to, to replace that gap. So one of the things we're doing is, is trying to find questions that um, uh, are pervasive, that, that, that persist across a vertical market, so that we can start solving some of these problems as a, as a, uh, as a service and, and provide that solution to, to multiple companies or to multiple stakeholders. Um, just to give you an idea of the sort of people that you need to solve these problems, um, uh, some of them, uh, some of my team are, are here today, put your hands up guys, are over there, they're available for uh, interesting stats talk um, at the next break. Um, but we've got some, you know, very interestingly qualified people to solve some of these problems. So we've got a professor in statistics, uh, PhDs in the engineering, data visualization. I've got, I've got astrophysics up here, but it's, it's cosmology, right? Sorry, sorry about that. Um, so these are quite a diverse set of uh, talents. Um, and what we've realized is that you need all of these people to come up with the answers, but you also need a, need a domain expert to, to explain that, um, uh, explain the question to the people who can answer them, and also make sure that the solution that you come up with uh, makes sense to the market that you're taking to. So um, we originally started in manufacturing, and when we got into health, um, we, we hired a, a, a medical doctor to help us understand um, exactly what the question was from the medical community and exactly how we might go about, about answering it. Um, so having talked big data down a little bit, um, I'm going to lift it back up again. Um, I was at, a, uh, at the SAP um, uh, Global Conference last week, and the CEO of uh, SAP stood up in front of everyone and said that he felt um, that the, the first sector, section of the um, uh, internet revolution was probably worth somewhere in the region of $16 trillion globally. So an absolutely you know, enormous amount of money. Um, but he then went on to say that he felt that uh, with the Internet of Things, with um, more pervasive analytics, better information on all of us and everything that we use, that there was $60 trillion in value to be unlocked over the next 10 years globally. Now that is an almost unfeasible amount of money. And if you think about it in the work that you're doing uh, in, in, in your own worlds, um, Really, the amount of information that we've got about our products, we've got about our customers, um, we've got about ourselves is, is exploding. Um, and once we get our hands around it, you know, computing power is no longer a problem. You know, we've all got more than enough computing power. Um, uh, there are no more infrastructure issues that are preventing us from leveraging the information that we have. Um, and it really will be transformational over the next few years. Um, so, as I said, I wanted to talk through some, some examples and, and, and maybe get you thinking about what you can do with this stuff. So as I said, where, where we started was, was in manufacturing. Um, we worked for Honda and Mazda and Ford and, and some uh, component suppliers as well. And, and what we do for them is we, we tell them how often we think their components are going to fail. Um, now, you might think that's something they know a pretty good uh, deal about already. Um, anyone who's been following the GM story in North America over the last 12 months will see that actually organizationally, um, car companies find it very difficult to track exactly what's going on with their products. So we come up with a, a, a solution, um, an algorithm, a method to, to come up with a really accurate forecast on the back of very small amounts of data to let us know, right, well, this, this alternator has failed 10 times in this, um, in this region. Um, we think, therefore, we're going to need 10,000 alternators over the next, um, next few years. Now, that's an interesting place to start, but we soon found out that our customers wanted to know a little bit more about that information. So uh, one of the things that we give them is an idea of whether or not dealers are doing things the correct number of times. So whether or not there's an opportunity to go out to the dealers and say, hey, you know, you should be replacing more radios, your customers probably aren't, aren't happy. And counter to that, to, for the manufacturers to find out whether or not their, um, their dealers are perhaps doing things, things too often. So I'm just going to quickly run through an, an example for you. Um, one of our customers uh, made a change to one of their products, and a, a particular component uh, no longer took four hours to repair. It, it took one hour to repair. Um, 
So this guy, number one up here, um, uh, is a particular dealer, quite a substantial dealer, showed up on our analysis, is all of a sudden doing this particular type of repair at 250% of the, of the regional benchmark. So he's doing it two and a half more times than he should do. Um, he's making a lot of money doing it because it's only taking him an hour and he gets to charge the manufacturer for, for four hours. So, so we tell the manufacturer that this is going on um, and the internal cogs start turning. It's not a simple process to, to start preventing this. So it's September 09. We roll that forward to October 09. And strangely, the four dealers nearest to the first guy start doing exactly the same thing. Um, we let her find out that dealer one and dealer 23 are really good mates. Um, dealer 23 has gone a bit crazy, so he, he's at 500% of the norm. Okay? So he, he's doing this five times more often than he should be. Now, the manufacturer is taking their time to do anything about this, and October runs into November, runs into December, and all of a sudden, the bad activity has completely infected the whole of this community, okay? So the information has spread far quicker than the manufacturer could control it. Now, fortunately, because we've started telling them that they had this problem fairly early on in the cycle, they were able to put a fix in place. And it was a very simple fix in this instance. Um, they just started telling the, man, the, the dealers, look, if you're going to repair this component, we really would like to have a picture. Um, they went live with that as a process in December 2009. And strangely, January 2010, everybody goes back to normal. Now, I like showing that because it's amazing to see how the information spreads across a community. It's great to see how a simple intervention can prevent some, some bad behavior. We saved this manufacturer $4 million just by helping them with this intervention. And we actually probably figured out that we saved them a lot more than that because they rolled out the intervention globally. But the other reason I like to show it is that we didn't start our engagement with this, particular, uh, with this particular problem with controlling the dealer network in mind. We had no idea that this was going to be the outcome. Um, and to give you an idea of what the value of this is, car manufacturers spend somewhere in the region of $50 billion a year on upholding product guarantee. So our ability to come in and reduce that by 10 15% is a genuine opportunity to remove $5 billion worth of excess cost um, from the automotive manufacturing sector. Um, and they'll be glad of that because they find it quite hard to, to make money in that particular um, environment. So that's a manufacturing example. And we've recently started working in healthcare. I just want to give a plug um, to the Welsh Government here who are doing a, a fantastic job trying to figure out how to engage with us SMEs around solving problems that they have. So there's something called the, um, the SBRI program. Um, I'm going to give him a bit of a headache and tell you who the guys who run it. It's a guy called Gareth Browning who works in uh, the ICT team and with David Warrender. Fantastic guy. And the interesting thing is, is that this mechanism enables government to, to go to market with a fairly, uh, fairly vague proposition with regards to what they want solving. So we're currently engaged um, with, the, uh, with the NHS on... Uh, looking at uh, diabetes and obesity in a particular community. And as I said, we, uh, we were very fortunate to work with um, Dr. Kerry Bailey, who came in from the, the clinical community to help us understand exactly the context of the question that was being asked and also how to communicate some of those answers. But you know, just imagine what more we can do if our GPs know a lot more information about us. Now, I, I'm, I'm not crazy. I don't think that doctors should know everything about us. I don't think Google should have every single possible piece of information. And I've got some recommended reading at the end, and I should highly recommend you reading a, a piece of uh, fiction called uh, uh, The Circle by David Eggers, which is a bit of a dystopian nightmare about what happens when we hand over all of our information. But really and truly, if we had a better idea about what was going on for every single data point, when you aggregate that information together, there is going to be some fascinating information about how we operate as individuals, where they'll be able to make fairly easy changes to our lives to have increasing effects. And if we look at how much money we're spending on healthcare, if we don't start taking advantage of these data sets, um, it won't be a question of, the, uh, uh, of protecting the data of the individual. Really, the morality is, is what we owe to society to start working on these data sets to understand where the excess cost is so that we can still afford our healthcare systems. Um, 
Another place to look as well is, is crime. Um, we work with uh, South Wales um, police, um, looking at how they can make better use of their data, who they're going to need, when they're going to need them, where they're going to need them, um, and pulling together some currently disparate data sets to understand what the opportunity is um, to get out there and, and, and deliver a, uh, a, a real uh, technology, scientifically-based um, service, which I think is a you know, great credit to them that they're, they're looking to do that. Um, as I said, I've got a, a bit of a suggested reading list here. Um, if you go onto McKinsey's uh, website, Big Data, The Next Frontier for Innovation, that's where this whole big data hype cycle started. Um, it's a bit big. I think it's like 400 pages. I think the exact summary is 40 pages. The first couple of pages are useful as well, um, in case you just want to dip in. Um, something else highly worth reading is uh, The Black Swan by Nassim Tlaib. Um, give you some context, really, in, maybe in some of the problems that you're looking at solving yourselves as to what's actually possible. You know, there's only so much we can do with the information that, that's, that's available to us right now. Um, it's not a crystal ball. It's not minority report. You know, there, are some, uh, there are some realistic ambitions that we can attain, and, uh, and Nassim Tlaib does a good job of uh, writing about that. And, uh, and, and finally, The Circle by, uh, by Dave Eggers is a, is a good read, even if it's a little bit scary. Um, just to close off on big data, really, I think what it has done is it's given large organizations permission to innovate. Um, it's been quite a long time, really, since we've updated our infrastructure. It was interesting to hear Sir Terry uh, mention this earlier and say that you know, we're, in a, we're in a period of renewal now uh, around our IT infrastructure. Now, the big multinationals that we work with are still working off AS400 mainframe systems. Um, and that technology was bought in the 90s. It was created in the 80s. I mean, realistically, it's 70s technology that we're using to run a lot of our businesses. And all of a sudden, this analytics idea, this pervasiveness of information about our products and our customers is giving us enough of a, a reason to invest in, in the future of our, of our businesses um, and the future of our communities. Um, and just to give you an idea about how, uh, how important um, uh, this type of analytics on these data sets is going to become, um, we were, we were shortlisted last year um, for the SMMT, so the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders um, Award for Innovation. Um, and we were up against the McLaren P1. Okay? So we lost. Um, but uh, that's just to give you an idea about where this is going. Okay? A bunch of statos with great viz experience created an analytical product that was considered as innovative as a million pound supercar that's changing production process, processes around the world. Um, and it's only going to become more important what we do with this information. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you go back to your workplaces and think about what's available in your data set. Um, and myself and the team will be available for the rest of the day if you have any questions. Thank you very much.